Okay, so I'm joined at this ungodly hour, some might say aptly, by uh, Stephen Law. Stephen Law is a senior lecturer at Haythrop College. He edits the philosophical journal Think. He's debated uh, William Lane Craig, Alvin Plantinga, Alistair McGrath, etc., etc. Some of his books include The Great Philosophers, uh, The Philosophy Gym, The War for Children's Minds. That last one is uh, very important. So if you've not got it, I suggest you go and uh, pick it up. And some of his academic papers include uh, papers on Wittgenstein, Modality, Kripke, Plantinga again, etc. So, uh, how are you, Stephen? I'm good, thank you. You have a paper on Wittgenstein uh, mm -hmm. dealing with section uh, 258, which is uh, the private language argument. Yes. Uh, John Locke famously said, Ideas are hidden from others, not of themselves can they be made to appear. How does Wittgenstein push against that conception? Well, he, um, he rejects the idea that the mind is a sort of private space or a private garden within which your ideas and your thoughts and your sensations appear and disappear. Um, in fact, he rejects it that not as a false theory about the mind, but as a, as a confused or nonsensical uh, theory. Um, and he attacks it in a variety of ways, um, one of which uh, is his uh, private language argument, which, as you say, uh, is focused around Section 258 in his philosophical investigations. And in the paper, you mentioned five private language arguments, uh, five different interpretations, and then you show why you don't find any of the five particularly convincing, even though some of them are cogent. Um, could you run us through any of the five? Could you tell us what problems you see? Yes. Um, I present, as you say, I present five different uh, interpretations of Section 258. Uh, I mean, and that's striking just by itself, really, that if the original section is so ambiguous that five completely different arguments can be, I mean, completely different arguments can be attributed to it. That's quite surprising. I, I, I'm not sure, I don't claim to know which of these arguments, if any, is the one that Wittgenstein actually intended to present. Um, I just go through these five different uh, interpretations and show why I can't, I can't see that there's a cogent argument on any of these interpretations. So there may be, there may yet be a cogent argument in there. It may be that Wittgenstein was offer, offering a cogent argument, but um, I can't see that any of these five do the job. So um, I'll give you an example. I think probably the most popular interpretation of, um, of 258 is something like this, that um, if you introduce a sign S for your private sensation and you uh, suppose that you've then introduced now a meaningful term, which you could perhaps write down in your diary every, every time that sensation uh, appeared in your mind. The problem that you have is that there's no way of independently checking whether or not you're applying this term correctly, whether you're following the rule correctly, the rule that you originally laid down when you correlated S with that particular sensation. Uh, there's nothing that you can appeal to independently of how it strikes you uh, that would allow you to confirm or disconfirm that you're applying S correctly. You just have to... You just remember, and you, but you can't tell whether you remember correctly or not. So that's the point on which the argument turns. And it's then suggested that if you cannot independently check or confirm that you're following a rule correctly, then there is no rule, because that's what a rule is. A rule is something independent of you against which you can check how well you are doing, against which you could be said to be going right or wrong but if there is no such thing then there is no such there is no rule and uh i'm not persuaded i'm not persuaded by that argument it seems to me that there can be rules even in the absence of any kind of independent check if i'm a, a prisoner trapped in a 
a cell and I notice rats appear some days and not others, I might put an exclamation mark in my diary on those days when a rat appeared um, and not otherwise. Um, I might do that for months very successfully. Have I, am I following a rule? For sure. And yet, you know, at any point, I might suddenly be struck by the doubt. What am I put, do I put down an exclamation mark on the days when there is a rat there or when there's days when there isn't a rat there? I might get a bang on the head and suddenly doubt my own memory. And there need be nothing independent to which I could appeal now to check which way I should be applying the symbol. Um, I need not have written down in the diary that exclamation mark means rat scene. I need not have shared my rule following practice with any of my jailers. And so I simply don't have anything at all that I can appeal to that would allow me to determine whether I'm following the rule correctly. And yet surely (laughs) I could have been following the rule correctly and indeed uh, might continue to follow the rule uh, correctly. So it seems to me that the private language argument, if it rests on that thought, that you need an independent standard of correctness before you can be said to follow a rule, that, that it rests on a principle that's just too strong. It would rule out my following a rule in that prisoner case, and surely I can follow a rule in the prisoner case. So why can't I follow a rule in the case of the prison of my mind, if you like, within which my private systems appear and disappear. You also uh, have authored a paper, I'll, I'll, I'll link it below, I'll link the other paper below as well, um, where you comment upon the Kripke and Wittgenstein debate regarding the standard meter. Yes. Um, I think there's some there's some link there between you know the, this, the denoting of the sensation by by the S and by the fact that Wittgenstein says you cannot say of a standard meter that it is or it isn't a meter. Would you say there's some um, there's some traction there? Would you say there's some there's some room for comparison there? Yes, I think uh, there may be a connection. Um, well, first of all, what's going on with the standard in that in that section in which Wittgenstein says you can't say of the standard meter that it is or it isn't a meter long. So the standard meter was this bar kept at uh, Severin in Paris, a silver bar that was used to calibrate all of the other uh, meter rules or or measures of one meter. Uh, They previously had a problem in France with a meter being a bit longer or a bit shorter in in one part of the country than it was in another. Uh, And so they decided to kind of standardise by using this particular object to arbitrate on what a true meter was. And Wittgenstein says about this particular object that you know, because of its peculiar role in that uh, practice of measuring, you can't say that it is uh, one meter long. Quite why you can't say that, it's not, you know, it's not, he doesn't spell it out, actually. Um, perhaps the thought is something like this, that if you say the standard meter is a meter long, you're merely saying that it's as long as it is which is not really to say anything substantive about it at all. (laughs) Uh, So that's why you can't, as it were, say that the standard metre is one metre long. I mean, you can say the words, but you're not really asserting anything any more than I assert something when I say that, you know, Fred is as tall as he is. It's not really giving you any information at all, is it? So um, I think possibly that's what's going on with the standard metre. That's why Wittgenstein says you can't say of it that it's a metre long. Um, I think Wittgenstein is, mista- is mistaken, as does Kripke. <laughs> as is, I mean, Kripke thinks Wittgenstein is wrong about the standard meter. I, I agree with Kripke. I think Wittgenstein is mistaken. But I think there may yet be something in what Wittgenstein says, which I then unpack in this paper on the standard meter. Um, so now your question is, is there a connection uh, between what Wittgenstein says about the standard meter and the private language argument? And... Um, I think possibly there is. So the problem with the standard meter saying that it's a meter long is that you're merely saying that it's as long as it is at any given point. Um, And that's not going to say anything about it at all because of the peculiar role that that object has in the practice of measuring. The fact that we're using it as a kind of sample. now, similarly, then, you might say that if I have a private sensation and I introduce the term S by reference to it, it doesn't really matter what sensation crops up later. Uh, 
that'll be S again if I think it's S again because S is whatever that is, <laughs> uh, the thing that crops up. Uh, now, so I can't, you know, I, I can't be said to have remembered correctly or incorrectly. There's no such thing as correct or incorrect. But therefore, there's no rule and therefore there's no meaning. Um, there, so you can see that there could be a connection here. The problem you might think with the private language is that whatever pops up, that that that'll be that'll be what you mean by s, irrespective of what it might happen to be. It can be a different sensation, the same sensation. It's irrelevant in the same way as if the standard meter gets longer or shorter. It doesn't matter because one meter is whatever length that stick is. Um, so yeah, there could be that connection between the two, um, those two thoughts. You made a really interesting point. Again, I'll link this paper. This is in reply to Alvin Plantingo. Now, I found this extremely interesting. I urge the people listening to go and read this one. Where you say, even if true belief is epiphenomenal and it has no causal impact on behaviour, evolution will still favour true belief. Could you unpack that a little for me? Mm. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to explain, but uh, it's, it, the point is that evolution will favour true belief given something else. <laughs> and that other thing is, if there are certain conceptual uh, constraints on how we class, uh, say, neurophysiological states as being the belief that this, rather than the belief that that, the belief that Paris is the capital of France, rather than the belief that there's cheese in the fridge. Um, it seems to me very plausible. I mean, whether or not you sign up to theories that say you can exclusively capture content, the content of a belief, in terms of, uh, say, uh, input and output to behaviour, you know, even whether or not functionalism is true, some sort of reductive functionalism or logical behaviorism or whatever is true, surely there is at least this much truth to those theories that there's some kind of conceptual connection between input and output and belief content such that you can't just plug any old belief content into any old neurophysiological state and say, oh, yeah, that, that, that's the belief that there's cheese in the fridge, despite the fact that it doesn't result in you going to the fridge when you want some cheese uh, and does result in you saying that Paris is the capital of France when you're asked what the capital of France is. Surely, <laughs> under those circumstances, uh, that state cannot uh, qualify uh, as the belief that there's cheese in the fridge rather than the belief that, the, the, that Paris is the capital of France. And if that's true, if there is this kind of conceptual connection between behaviour and content, that is, funnily enough, enough to allow natural selection to select the true belief, even if mental content and mental states are epiphenomenal, that's to say, even if they don't themselves have any causal impact on each other or on behaviour. Um, uh, Alvin Plantinga's thought is that if naturalism is true, he doesn't like naturalism, by which he roughly means atheism, if, if, if naturalism slash atheism is true, then probably some form of epiphenomenalism is true. And if epiphenomenalism is true, then... Natural selection can't select for true beliefs rather than false beliefs. But if not, natural selection can't do that, then there's no reason to suppose that we have evolved cognitive faculties that will tend to produce true beliefs. Why should natural selection favour true belief or indeed faculties that tend to produce true beliefs? There's no reason to expect that. If there's no reason to expect that. There's no reason for us to suppose that we have reliable cognitive faculties, but then we should doubt that all of the... Um, beliefs that are produced by them, including our belief that naturalism is true. So naturalism, according to Plantinga, is a kind of self-defeating belief in a way that theism isn't, because if there's a God who's like us, who's a good God, uh, who made us in his image, he will have engineered us or engineered the, the um, evolutionary mechanisms that produced us in such a way, he will have tweaked them in such a way as to produce beings with reliable cognitive faculties. So uh, theism is not self-defeating, he says, but naturalism is. 
And sorry, this is a very long story I'm telling. Uh, so I, I reject that argument. It seems to me that actually evolution can favour true belief, even if it's true that uh, mental content has no causal effect on our behaviour whatsoever, which is, of course, absurd anyway. Of course it does. But uh, according to Plantinga, if naturalism is true, then it's unlikely that it would have... Uh, so some listeners will be thinking, why on earth does he think that? And <laughs> uh, why does he think that if naturalism is true, um, our belief content is likely to be epiphenomenal? It's because I think he thinks that uh, if naturalism is true, then it's only physical properties, physical states and so on that have causal clout. But then anything that isn't some physical state or property will lack causal clout and if the mental uh, is not reducible to such things then it will be epiphenomenal um, so I think he's thinking along those lines We're speaking about atheism we're speaking about um, theism um, I mentioned the ungodly hour before so um, there's a lot of theists that claim that the burden of proof rests on atheists, the same happens with an atheist debate um, theists, they say no the burden of proof is on you Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that? I mean, can somebody say that there is no God? Can somebody uh, cogently say there is? Uh, I think we can conclusively rule out certain God hypotheses on the basis of reason and indeed uh, observation in, in many cases. Um, irrespective of where the burden of proof lies, I think we can prove beyond reasonable doubt that, there are, that certain gods do not exist. Um, so um, examples would be a god that created the universe uh, 6,000 years ago. Yeah, we can establish beyond reasonable doubt that there isn't a god that did that. Um, a god that answers petitionary prayer, uh, that perhaps intervenes to make heart patients better uh, when people pray for them. Uh, there have been two massive expensive studies, double-blind studies, properly conducted into whether petitionary prayer helps heart patients, and both found that it had no effect. Um, and that was not merely an, an absence of evidence for prayer working to help people. It was evidence that, of absence, if you like, that prayer doesn't have those kinds of effects. And if it's evidence for that, then it's evidence for there not being a God that answers petitionary prayers in that way. So you can certainly confirm and disconfirm God hypotheses empirically, even scientifically, depending on uh, precisely what the hypothesis is. Some of these God hypotheses have, you know, empirically testable consequences, for example. Um, so now the question is, well, what do, what do religious people mean by God? Uh, they're going to back away from those specific claims in many cases. They're going to say, oh, I don't believe in a God that necessarily created the universe 6,000 years ago or that actually answers prayers. My, my belief is in something a little less uh, specific. Well, if their belief is simply in the existence of a cosmic doodah about which they make no positive claims at all, then that certainly is a very hard claim to refute. Uh, at this point, I think points about uh, uh, the, the issue of burden of proof might, might enter in and we could apply that and say, well, why do you think it's a cosmic doodah? Why on earth uh, should we suppose that there is one rather than that there isn't one? And surely the onus is on you to give me some reason to suppose that there is one rather than on me to show that there isn't. Uh, we could pursue that. Um, however, the fact is that the vast majority of religious people do um, believe things about God, indeed attribute to God certain essential features, uh, such as omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence. Uh, and if there's a God with those features, well, actually, that, it turns out that does have empirical consequences. Uh, the world should not contain any gratuitous evils. It shouldn't contain pain and suffering, for example, for which there is no God-justifying reason. And when you look at the universe, it appears to contain immense quantities of suffering for which there is pretty obviously no God-justifying reason. I'm talking, for example, about uh, hundreds of millions of years of animal, appalling animal suffering before we even show up 
I'm talking about childhood mortality rates at around 30 to 50 percent for the entire, almost the entire 200,000 year history of human beings living on this planet. Those children would have died horribly. Uh, their parents would have had to watch their children die horribly and slowly and be able to do nothing about it. Extraordinary physical and psychological suffering. Uh, that we've only very recently been in a position to do anything about. Um, is there really going to, likely to be a good justifying reason for all of that, you know, horror, the killing, you know, the killing of children on an industrial scale over the history of humanity? Pretty unlikely, I think. So it's pretty unlikely there's a god because a god like that, the three O's god, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, will not allow for such pointless suffering. So that's good empirical evidence, it seems to me, actually, against the existence of a good God. Many people will reject that and say, no, 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 I can, I can come up with reasons why God would allow for this suffering. Or even if I can't, there could be a reason. Just because I can't think of it doesn't mean it's not there. In fact, there could quite easily be reasons that are known to God, that are unknown to me. I'm just a human being with limited cognitive abilities. So I'm just in no position to assert that there are any gratuitous reason, um, evils, that there, that, there are, that there is suffering for which there is no good justifying reason. It may be that the reason's there and I'm just not aware of it. Um, people that take that line are, are often called sceptical theists. And it's one of the leading responses to this particular objection to belief in God. One of the leading ways in which people try and theists try and defend their belief when they're presented with what appears to many of us to be overwhelming empirical evidence against what they uh, believe. Um, but I'm not persuaded uh, by sceptical theism. Um, one thing that you can do, I think, to uh, <laughs> uh, dislodge the thought that sceptical theism is effective. Uh, is to point out that it works just as well in defence of belief in an evil God, a God that is uh, all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, and omni-malevolent, not omni-benevolent, a God whose cruelty is beyond our comprehension and whose malice knows no bounds. There's just the one God we might suppose, and that's him. Who believes in a God like that? Nobody. It's a ludicrous thing to believe. Why is it a ludicrous thing to believe? Because, look around you, <laughs> there are too many gratuitous goods, love, laughter, ice cream and rainbows. I mean, an evil God might put some good in the world for evil reasons, but there's way too much good, uh, much of it surely uh, gratuitous from the point of view of such a supremely powerful, malignant uh, being. Uh, why would an evil God allow us to be nice to each other, for example? Why would an evil God give us a lovely view? Why would he give us children to love who love us unconditionally in return and so on? So you might think, almost everyone does think, that there's ample evidence against an evil God. But sceptical theism works just as well here. Uh, I can say, if I believe in an evil God, ah, yes, but uh, just because you can't think of a reason why an evil God would allow these goods doesn't mean that there isn't a good evil reason for allowing those goods. Uh, and so you don't know that there are any gratuitous goods, in which case you don't know that there isn't an evil God. And in fact, an evil God would explain many things like the fine-tuned character of the universe, why there's something rather than nothing, uh, and so on. So I can also run ontological arguments for an evil God, um, such as this, uh, in this style of St. Anselm. I can conceive of a maximally evil being, evil God. Uh, it would be more evil for that being to exist in reality than merely in my imagination, surely. That seems true. Therefore, evil God must exist. Uh, so there you go. Uh, who believe, you know, it, it, we can run the same loops. Uh, we can give many of the same arguments for an evil God as for a good God. We can defend belief in an evil God in much the same way as we can defend belief in a good God. Uh, and yet everyone knows belief in an evil God is ludicrous. So the question is, well, if belief in an evil God is ludicrous, why on earth should we consider belief in a good God? even, you know, significantly more reasonable than that, even, you know, not unreasonable, even as being not unreasonable, given that um, any belief in an evil God is downright ridiculous. 
Uh, and so that challenge I call the Evil God Challenge, uh, and I wrote a paper of that of that title. And there's also a book coming, a UP book, the Evil God Challenge. I haven't written it yet. I saw an article you did on uh, Jeremy Corbyn supporters um, speaking about Islamism. This will be the last question. So before before I say this, I wanted to thank you. People who are listening, you won't know that uh, me and Stephen spoke once before and we had a few problems, all my fault. And he graciously, um, he, he graciously gave me some time to speak with him again. So I, thank you very much, Stephen. For, I really, honestly, I really appreciate it. That's fine. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, so you wrote an article on on, Cor- on Corbyn supporters and how uh, how they what they think about Islamism, what they think about the impact is. Could you finish off just by running us through what you found? Um, mm. And what and what sorry and what you did it in response to? Because I believe it was in response to a journalist. Yeah, well, there's, there are there are many people, uh, not just this one journalist, but many people are saying that Corbyn supporters uh, hate the West blame terrorist attacks exclusively on the West and our expansionist and evil activities around the world, particularly the, the, the Middle East. Uh, that's the real cause of these, these terrible events, not Islam, which is innocent, uh, and so on. And, um, well, I support Corbyn, but I don't hold any of those views. Um, I mean, so obviously, I think that, you know, Western policies in the Middle East have contributed to uh, our problems. The invasion of Iraq pretty obviously played a causal role in producing uh, ISIS. ISIS in turn uh, plays a causal role in producing certain terrorist attacks such as those in Paris. So, you know, it, it would be absurd to deny that there is a connection there and that we have some responsibility and almost everyone accepts that the West has some responsibility. But that's not to entirely um, render blameless um, Religion. Uh, it seems to me that Islam uh, has a very significant role to play too. Um, I'm certainly no apologist for Islamism. I think that Islamism is a very significant problem uh, in the UK, certainly in some universities where I visited, uh, in certain cultural corners uh, of the UK, and so on. So I'm not like, uh, you know, I don't fit this picture that's uh, typically presented of Corbynites, Corbyn supporters, um, by their, by Corbyn's uh, opponents. Um, And so I was just curious to find out what Corbyn supporters actually do think. So I conducted a Twitter poll, or several Twitter polls, uh, just to find out what the Twitterati, or certainly the Twitterati that follow me, um, actually think about Corbyn. And lo and behold, Many of them are like me. Um, they think that you know Islamism is a significant problem in the UK. They only ten percent thought that um, terrorist attacks such as Paris have nothing to do with the West. Um, sorry, have are entirely the fault of the West and have nothing to do with Islam. So the vast majority would reject that view. The view that is being attributed to us Corbynites by certain journalists. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Nick Cohen, who, who, you know, I know Nick Cohen, his friend, I would consider him to be a friend, uh, and I generally respect him, but it seems to me he says some very silly things about Corbyn uh, supporters, things that are not substantiated, things which are invariably justified by him and others by appealing to anecdotal evidence, which, as we all know, is terrible evidence. Any critical thinker can tell you that, right? It's always possible to pick out a few individuals and say, or even quite a lot of individuals and say, look, they're all of this view, therefore all of you are of this view. Um, and that's actually, that doesn't establish that. Uh, that doesn't support um, the view of these journalists and other critics of Corbyn supporters and it turns out that when we actually try and get a more accurate picture of what Corbyn supporters believe they don't really they don't really believe that at all so I want them to pack it in now I don't want to read more articles saying that Corbyn supporters hate the West are, are apologists for Islamism blah 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 I, that should now stop because it's untrue it's pretty clearly untrue and there was never any really good evidence for it in the first place in other words it's just a kind of smear 
uh, and uh, people should be ashamed of perpetuating it if they continue to perpetuate it after I've pointed this out. Excellent. Well, uh, as I said, I do really appreciate the time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll link your blog below as well because I think people who are listening should really go and read it. There's always good stuff on it and it's updated frequently. 